Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Here's a cool fact. A crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Another cool fact, you can get short-term health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short-term insurance plans are designed for people who are between jobs, coming off their parents' plan, or turning a side hustle into a full-time gig. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage with access to a nationwide network of doctors and hospitals. Get more cool facts about United Healthcare short-term plans at uh1.com. Say hello to a new era of mental health care. Cerebral is here to help you achieve your mental wellness goals with professional therapy and medication management support. 100% online. You'll experience the all-new Cerebral way, an innovative approach to mental wellness designed around you. You'll get a personalized treatment plan from a therapist, prescriber, or both in a safe and judgment-free space. Your cerebral therapist or prescriber will outline a customized plan with clear milestones along the way, so you can get to feeling your best. With Cerebral, you're not alone in your mental health journey. We're here to empower you to live a fulfilling life. So take that first step towards a brighter future and sign up today at Cerebral.com slash podcast and use code ACAST to get 15% off your first month. Offer only valid on monthly plans. Other exclusions may apply. Offer ends July 31st, 2024. See site for details. With LinkedIn Jobs, we tap into a network of more than a billion professionals to help you find quality professionals quickly and easily for any role you need. Marketing wizards? Found them. Software engineers? Found. That project manager I could never seem to hire? And found. LinkedIn Jobs quickly matches your roles with candidates with the right skills and experience. In fact, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Post your first job for free and get started at linkedin.com slash spoken. That's linkedin.com slash spoken. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder. Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all of my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I am just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Dr. Jan Eppingstall, a Melbourne-based counsellor in Australia who specialises in working with people who hoard. Jan, how are you? I am excellent and I'm very excited for the next month because I'm going to Japan! Yay! So cool. Taking the whole family there and I promise I'm not going to buy too much stationery. I promise. <laughs> promise, promise, promise. But you know, I just just a suitcase <laughs> worth. Yeah. I might have to do a whole podcast on, you know, like I should do a YouTube video or something with, you know, the unboxing, the opening of the suitcase, Pandora's box of stationery. So please um, don't think I don't hoard people. Uh, will it be titled Do As I Say, Not As I Do? <laughs> I like that. That has a nice ring to it. No, it's very cool. I hope you have a fabulous time. Yes, we will. So that means that Jan will be skipping the December episode and will be back with us in January. So today we are talking about homelessness and hoarding. Now, there's less published research on this than we'd like, um, although I do know there's some work being done in Oxford um, on this topic at the moment and probably other places too. But in the absence of reams and reams of data, we're going to be using some degree 
of applying what we do know about hoarding to situations of people who are or used to be homeless and making connections based on that. So when looking at links between homelessness and hoarding, a couple of things stood out to me straight away. One is that a lot of the things that can lead to homelessness can also lead to hoarding, such as trauma and loss. Another is that a lot of people who experience homelessness have a range of mental health problems, many of which can co-occur with hoarding, not to mention that hoarders might experience acute fear of scarcity. Homeless people live in extreme scarcity. It seems almost logical to me that if they are eventually housed, they just never let anything go again. Mm. So while people's first reaction to the idea of people who are homeless being hoarders might be, but they how if they don't have anywhere to live, there are it seems to me like there are actually some fairly obvious connections when you scratch beneath the surface, right? Oh, yeah, um, it's right. I mean, that is correct. But, you know, it's always been the position of hoarding academia that material deprivation, as they like to call it, isn't linked to hoarding. Um, that it's more like emotional deprivation that leads to that. And I actually don't know if we can be that confident without more research. Um, if we think if we think about it, it's really unlikely that the participants recruited in those early hoarding studies in the 90s were homeless or living in temporary accommodation. I mean, the internet, the internet was like an embryo then. So members of the homeless community were not filling in these questionnaires. Um, and having said that, as you mentioned, I've looked at my database of seven or 800 hoarding-related articles and there's only one or two focused on this area and it's 2023 so clearly we don't feel that it's an important connection to make which I think is quite disappointing but clinically you know hoarding disorder is when we experience discarding to be extremely difficult because we've got that sense that the emotional distress we anticipate we're kind of like anticipating that we'll feel so overwhelmed that we won't cope Right. So for someone who's homeless, this distress isn't actually unreasonable or irrational. It's real, right? So it's just it's just really difficult. For someone who is homeless, the volume and type of possessions may need to be, you know, portable or, you know, easily, um, easily kind of packed up. But the underlying behavior of excessive saving is there isn't it? It's like it's it's yeah. it's baked in, you know, and when possessions become available and they have the capacity and the space to acquire, chances are they will, right? So it is a really, it's an important area that really needs a lot more research to understand, understand how this might occur, how we can, um, how we can support these people when we're looking at rehome, you know, finding new homes or um, working with them when they're actually out uh, in temporary accommodation as well. That's one of the trickiest ones. Yeah. Because yeah. It, it's, you know, it, it's then they need to move on. How, how can we manage uh, that process too? And there's no thought given to that at all. The other link that seemed fairly obvious to me was that the cause and effect can be the other way round. In fact, as I'm sure you found too, when you look in the literature, nearly all papers that mention both homelessness and hoarding are about preventing people becoming homeless if they hoard. So homelessness caused by hoarding. Somebody might be evicted and become ho homeless because of the state of their home. Now, if that person who already hoarded then loses everything they own in a really traumatic way, then mm. lives the trauma of homelessness, ever gets rehoused, I can't see many other outcomes than them filling their new home up again. Mm. And this was backed up for me by a woman from a homeless shelter who told The Atlantic, a lot of times in their minds, it's preparing for the personal apocalypse 
it's when my life falls apart and I have this personal apocalypse, I need to be prepared because I've seen it happen before. And all I can think is that as a society, we need to be looking at more systemic solutions to problems like poverty. It's hard to see how any one intervention has a chance of addressing this stuff. Me too. Like I, that's exactly exactly how I feel. I mean, there's so much I could say kind of about systemic failure in Australia around poverty, homelessness, trauma and mental illnesses that result, right? And perhaps selfishly I feel that there's a need to recognise the complicated nature of hoarding behaviours and how they then complicate these issues. So it's, it's, it needs to be an ongoing process. Like it's not a one and done quick fix thing. Yeah. And everything around hoarding, because there's that lack of understanding, you know, about how it, how it evolves, how it becomes so um, overwhelming, we don't, we kind of just think, oh, we can just snap our fingers yeah. and fix it. Where it's just, you know, it's a bullet. It's, you know, but it's not, it's not a one and done. I mean, when we give a homeless person a place to live, we can't just walk. We can't just walk away. Yeah, and we also can't dictate how they live either. You know, it's a wicked problem, isn't it? It's there's no straightforward solution that's simple or final. Yeah, um, and we give lip service to prevention, like we were constantly talking about early diagnosis. You know, oh, that would be fantastic if we could work out exactly who's going to have this problem. But even if we could predict it, who would begin to hoard at clinical levels, we don't have the resources to support them once they're housed. It's like it is just so complicated and it's it's one of those things that a lot of people don't want to tackle because probably our system of government um, is very similar to yours. You know, it's a very sh- everything's a very short term. Yeah, fix, you know, between elections, what can we do with the three years or whatever we have? And that's just never going to that's never going to be successful. And if you if somebody is rehoused, and the issues that caused the original homelessness have not been addressed, whatever they are, mm-hmm. um, and then there's additional trauma. In some research I did for something else several years ago, the numbers of sexual assaults on homeless women, um, if they also have mental health problems, are something like 97%. Uh And so you've got the original issues that led to homelessness, plus additional re-traumatization when you're... um, homeless just giving somebody a key and saying here's your new flat nothing's been resolved (laughs) yeah yeah bye (laughs) here you go off you go there's no support network there's no um assistance in how to and even if there is it's more about you know finger pointing and telling and not about kind of that understanding the compassionate kind of approach yeah. of saying well how would you like to live what would you like to do you know what do you need no one ever asks that question I was just talking to this with uh, talking about this with a client the other day and she's just you know that's one of the things that she's slipped in, into her lexicon a lot now that she's working with you know with children with neurodiversities is What do you need? (laughs) We just never ask that, (laughs) which is quite frightening. It's really frightening to me. It might be something really simple. It might be something really simple and inexpensive that will prevent another personal apocalypse. Mm. Well said. (laughs) Thank you. Another interviewee in that Atlantic piece, which I will link to in the show notes, said it's very much about safety and control when they're in a transitional housing program they have people coming into their houses every week and telling them how to live these become issues of control for them 
You can tell me how to live. You can tell me what I can or can't do. But these are my things and they represent me and you cannot take them away from me. They represent my history, my story. Now, I feel like a hoarder could have said those exact words. It makes sense to me. Oh, exactly, exactly. I mean, possessions offer all of us that sense of control and safety. And that's so that's completely missing in a homeless person's life, that certainty and sense of comfort as well. It, it, the sense of comfort's definitely not there because, you know, the, the, even just the simple having shelter is is removed. I mean, we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't see a reflection of ourselves in this. I mean, I know I haven't had someone coming into my home telling me how many jam jars are acceptable yes. to keep or what sp- what my space should look like ever. Well, other than my mother, but that's <laughs> better left unsaid. But just putting yourself in in their shoes, you can feel the strong need to exert control over your stuff and protect it as part of you yeah. because we know that's how we we know that that's how we feel everybody feels that yeah um but i did also note in some of the stories i read that this you know there was this kind of sense of hope that the excess that their excessive amount of stuff gave them like that there was a normal life for them in the future that they could create out of out of these possessions and i think that's something as well if we take it away do we then take away that hope for that normalcy that normal life that could come in the future uh but yeah it definitely is part of i mean whenever someone says to me you know can you imagine how it would be if someone ca- and i'm like yep I can imagine someone digging around in my drawers or, you know, opening cupboards. The horror, yeah. really, like the horror. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't take a lot to step into a person's shoes and recognise um, how much safety and control they get from looking after their possessions. And in normal circumstances, I think people are generally very like if I'm at even my best friend's house I will say oh do you mind if I get a glass of water like I don't want to just go into her cupboards and get a glass and go you know and that's somebody who I'm the most comfortable with and so this idea that it's fine to go to somebody's house and open their cupboards and then say that's not okay it's a different that that degree of dignity and respect just isn't always there, is it? No. You know what? As you were saying that, it was making me think of being a pregnant woman yeah. and having people, just strangers, think that it's okay for them to touch your belly. It's almost like, you know, if you, ha- if you have a lot of stuff, People feel like, I don't know, that, that, that they have some right to sort of touch all these things and make comments about it. And you think, what makes you think that you have that right and, and, and take the dignity from me by putting your hands on everything in my space? Unreal. So a 2020 study looked at people who were either homeless or living in supported housing and found that while hoarding disorder affects between one and a half percent and five percent of the general population there were hoarding behaviors in 18.5 percent of these people who were either homeless or in supported housing it's a relatively speculative finding from what i could tell but what did you make of this info yeah well it makes sense because this is technically what's called an oversample okay i did this in my research It's a technique that academics use to assist them um, when researching rare subpopulations. Okay. So you basically, you fish where the fish are. Yeah, I mean, I went to groups where people who hoard are most likely, you know, social media, um, you know, Facebook groups, that sort of thing, Um, you know, notice boards and things like that, bulletin boards and stuff on various websites, Um, where people who hoard are more likely to you know, so that I could recruit participants who had higher levels 
of hoarding behaviours. I mean, it introduces bias kind of strategically to make sure that you have a large enough sample of that rare subgroup to make sure you've got enough power to do your analyses. Yeah. The distribution of my hoarding severity, um, like, you know, my my distribution curve was normal, though. So it was still a bell curve. So I still had the, um, you know, most of the participants were in that central area and then only some on either end. But I didn't need to kind of survey thousands of participants to get self-reported clinically significant people who hoard. So this figure of 18.5, you know, it's significantly higher than you would find in the general population. But what also got my juices a little bit boiling was that they only used a pictorial measure to identify hoarding behaviours. So they just showed them the clutter image rating scale. Now, I mean, that's not enough, as we previously discussed. I mean, there's many things that look like hoarding if we just use clutter as that measure of severity to diagnose people. Um, But I don't think this finding is surprising when we consider the risk factors of homelessness and that oversampling. You know, they're sampling in the population where you're going to find um, you're going to find this uh, this phenomenon really. So you mentioned risk risk factors. If you look at the risk factors for homelessness, you could almost be reading a list of risk factors for hoarding, from trauma and grief to brain injury and neurodivergence, as we've talked about recently. It's uncanny, right? Yeah, exactly. And this is why this finding study finding is not surprising. But, you know, if homelessness, poverty, deprivation were kind of direct triggers of hoarding disorder, as many people in the general public believe, this number would be much higher, right? So, you know, 18.5%, well, if, if, this, if these things do directly, if there was a cause and effect, we'd see, you know, significantly higher numbers. But, yeah, it is uncanny. It is those, all those same um, risk factors that we've kind of, researched and come up with those vulnerabilities for hoarding yeah and homelessness they I mean they ident- they're identical they are <laughs> they are now there is a website called London Homeless Info and a homeless person who wrote on there disputes that a lot of hoarding in homeless people is true hoarding disorder thinking it's more likely to be autism and ADHD related, which is no doubt true for at least some of those cases. But I thought this observation was interesting. They said, for years, we got used to being in a very small space, whether a doorway less than two metres by one metre or about the same space in a shelter. When we get rehoused, we suddenly have a whole flat. A whole empty flat with no furniture, carpets or curtains, just bare walls. We're not used to having so much space, so much empty space. So we fill it with stuff until it no longer looks empty. Does that make sense to you? Oh, does it ever? I mean, the sense of safety we feel when we're surrounded by our possessions, it's a big motivator to accumulate stuff. Um, and that that physical barrier between us and that chaotic outside world, you know, that's likely to have been cruel and traumatic in the past, you know, is often described by people uh, who've experienced home, homelessness and then also those that struggle with hoarding behaviours. So empty is an indication of lack of. And the excess stuff, as I said before, could be an indication of hope for a better future for that person that wants to build it. But I do think that it's also our consumer society. We put so much pressure on people to make a home because that signals success and normalcy. You know, it's very compelling, isn't it? Um, We look at TV shows, you know, with the perfect families and they all, you know, they have the perfect home Um, And I know many people feel that they need to create this home, but often they have no idea how to make that happen. And they begin to accumulate things like, oh, well, this is what normal people have. This is what normal people have. Oh, I see this. I see this. And very soon it kind of gets out of hand and, you know, and, and it's overwhelming. 
yeah. um, which is totally understandable because it might be the first time ever that they've had the space and the agency, which I think is really important to know, yeah. to do it. And um, if, if having nothing is a symbol of where I used to be and having stuff is a symbol of where I want to be, you get the stuff. You get the stuff. And, and it, we know how much stuff is available to acquire in so many different ways, um, you know, if, often for no cost. It's just that getting rid of it costs. So when we, when we acquire it, it, there's no cost to us. But then if we want to try and, you know, uh, try the depos- you know, the disposition process, like we want to get rid of everything, it's so expensive or time-consuming or both. Um, but getting it's not necessarily the problem, is it? <laughs> Quite often it's real easy, real easy. Yeah. <laughs> If you've been wondering how you can support the podcast, there are loads of options that can really help. These include donations, but if that's not something you're able to do, you can also help by leaving a review, sharing the podcast on social media, linking to the podcast from your website, or following me on social media. There are loads of possibilities. Find out more at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash support. Say hello to a new era of mental health care. Cerebral is here to help you achieve your mental wellness goals with professional therapy and medication management support. 100% online. You'll experience the all new Cerebral way, an innovative approach to mental wellness designed around you. You'll get a personalized treatment plan from a therapist, prescriber, or both in a safe and judgment-free space. Your cerebral therapist or prescriber will outline a customized plan with clear milestones along the way, so you can get to feeling your best. With Cerebral, you're not alone in your mental health journey. We're here to empower you to live a fulfilling life. So take that first step towards a brighter future and sign up today at Cerebral.com slash podcast and use code ACAST to get 15% off your first month. Offer only valid on monthly plans. Other exclusions may apply. Offer ends July 31st, 2024. See site for details. Hey, everyone. I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend, John Calipari. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Now, an article from the Single Homeless Project says, when this compulsion does manifest, it's likely the person has always had a hoarding disorder, but hasn't had a place to store their possessions before, which I think could apply But I can also imagine there are cases where there's a potential for hoarding in a person, but if their life had gone smoothly, it wouldn't have made itself known. It's the trauma of their parents kicking them out when they're 15 because they're LGBT or the grief when their remaining living parent dies or the domestic abuse that forces them to leave their home that leads to their homelessness that also leads to hoarding disorder materialising? What do you think? Exactly. Like you're describing that epigenetic process, which is what is believed. We still don't have solid research on epigenetic processes in, in, in a lot of ways, but that's what's believed to happen in psychopathology such as hoarding. So someone has certain vulnerabilities like a family member who hoards neurodivergence, trauma, complicated grief or any number of other adverse childhood experiences becomes homeless, that flips a bunch of switches and turns on that those particular genes that lead to hoarding being used as their coping mechanism. I mean, if everything has been run of the mill in their lives with no major difficulties, they had supportive emotional emotionally mature parents, uh, they had stable housing, then the hoarding, you know, might continue to remain 
dormant, so to speak. So I think there's some, like, I think there's some of both. I don't think we, I don't, we don't know enough to sort of be able to say that definitively. Yeah, I wouldn't want to, yeah, I wouldn't want to be the one to say that they likely always had something um, and just didn't have a place to store it before. I think, I think that's, it's risky, people. That's risky. So I am lucky enough to have never been homeless, um, but a period of poverty is what I believe pushed the button to move me from being a messy person to a hoarder. When you don't know if there will be more food or if there will be more soap or if there will be more clothes ever, stockpiling does feel like the only option. And then if you do get those things, you never let them go. If you don't have a steady home, that must be exacerbated even more. And of course, most homeless people are not sleeping on the street. They're in some form of insecure housing, hostels, they're sofa surfing. So it's not impossible that they're stockpiling even without a home. Even if they're street sleepers, they might have a shopping trolley with everything they can find. Somebody told me the other day that it's quite it's quite common for people who are unhoused to trade stuff with each other. And so it makes sense to hold on to things. And so mm. if people do find more secure housing, I can see I will never get rid of anything and I will immediately start filling this space up with everything I might ever need so I'm never without what I need again kicking in. Are there ways to interrupt that instinct? Yeah, this is really difficult to grapple with, isn't it? Because this is a rational survival instinct. Our brain is telling us, and in this case rightly, that we need to save stockpile ration. What we do have, I mean, who can tell us when that survival situation is over and we no longer need to save? There's no, you know, there's no nothing that can tell us that. I mean, that notion that we spoke of before about preparing for the personal apocalypse, that is not catastrophizing because it's happened before. Yeah. It's it, it's not a it's it, it's not something it's not that hypothetical. We can yeah, no, it's not something we can use CBT to kind of like change our mind because we this person has been there. Although some CBT therapists would still try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know what they would because they're so you know they're CBT down to their bones. I I, I can definitely see that happening but that instinct to grab the stuff now just in case is primal especially when you've experienced what it's like to be without it so how can you interrupt it so for some people and a bit of anecdotal stuff um, it's possible possible to kind of put rational numbers around your stockpiling so do the calculations and see how many years the cakes of soap you've accumulated will last you know will you live that long do you feel safe enough to donate some to those who are homeless or insecurely housed so that they may have some um it it, it it's not going to happen easily <laughs> and it, it's not going to um you're not you're not necessarily going to feel that you are confident that the survival situation is over so that's what's so hard about it. But I do think interrupting it by putting rational numbers, but also thinking about other people who might be out there where you once were and thinking about how you might be able to help someone else can really take your mind off, you know, off that whole personal survival avoidance of the of the apocalypse and look outward. I think that would that that would actually help you to interrupt it and sharing what you have with others. Yes, I was talking to my counselor the other day about that period of poverty and how scarring it was, but how also I had a couple of close friends who were in a very similar situation and how if one of us got something it would be shared immediately. Mm. Even though we had 
nothing. If I got a bag of potatoes, I would be like, come round, I've got potatoes. <laughs> you know, it was, um, yeah, that sharing yeah. instinct is really strong. Yeah, yeah. And I think we, we do, <laughs> I don't know about you, but whenever I watch these shows on TV like, uh, you know, like zombie apocalypse type shows or um, one of the ones I watched was The Dome, right? So, you you know, there's just you and you're cut off from the world and how are people going to react? And often the selfishness of people is what is <laughs> most dramatic, so they try and focus on that. But then you think about, say, the Blitz in London during the Second World War and how everyone came together, everyone shared, everyone um, made sure that, you know, they gathered people in their local area to go into the bunkers, et cetera. Like I think we really, yeah, we underestimate how much humans want to share uh, and, and when it's, when you do, become um you know when you have been homeless and you do become more secure in your uh, uh you know in your life giving back then is is something that you can do that will hopefully reduce that instinct to kind of stockpile um possibly with the assistance of therapy because there's a, also a lot of other things that you need to deal with psychologically um, but yeah. So if there's a positive to take from this, mm. it's that it seems to me like, to me, a surprising number of housing charities and support services are clearly already really aware of hoarding as an issue. So while there's a massive lack of academic research in this area, I, I was pleasantly surprised by the number of um, homelessness charities who are actually talking about this to some degree. So if a listener needs help from a housing organisation, is it realistic to say that this won't be the first time that the person who answers the phone has come across hoarding disorder? Mm, I, I, I do think it's become quite widely recognised, yes, particularly in those hands-on, you know, frontline kind of roles. But I do still think there's that lack of understanding by those frontline practitioners of the variety of things that could yeah. look like it, as we've already discussed. Um, and the use of just pictorial ratings to indicate hoarding severity um, as they, they used in that academic article, is an example of that oversimplification of the problem. Um, clutter is just what you can see. We need to be much more judici judicious in our assessment of cases so that we can then help the person in the best way we can. I mean, it might not be hoarding or it might not be hoarding alone. Yes. <laughs> or it could be evidence of neurodivergence or organic brain injury, schizophrenia. I mean, you know, we discussed this, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, if we don't ask the right questions and offer the right support for the case, you know, people like myself, we're not doing our jobs because it can be very easy to just go, oh, right, I know what, I know what this is. Yep, confirmed it. Um, and then off on that uh pathway yeah. which is not necessarily you know you're off you're out there alone and the poor person that you're attempting to help is sitting back there saying but that's not what I need yeah yeah <laughs> I need these things yeah mm. so yeah holistic approach and actually listening to what the person <laughs> wants and needs ultimately <laughs> I know that's one of the hard like the hardest thing is there's funding for all these things but then the funding is not for you know, it'd be it'd be kind of better to just like fund a person <laughs> and have a, a certain amount of money, you know, that can be utilised yeah. in order to allow them to do or, or 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 have the services provided that they need. But of course, bureaucracy, systems, political <laughs> infighting. The phrase that keeps coming to mind is we need some joined up thinking. Mm. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That is just spot on. 
That's what we need is joined up. The, it's just like let's look at this problem from as many uh, angles as we possibly can and just keep iterating, see what works, do more of what works and then just keep trying. And, oh, that didn't quite work. Now we'll try. But as I said, the short-term the short term focus of um, of our systems of government just don't allow for that. So it's just about the quick fix. How do I get elected? <laughs> Once I'm elected, yeah. I may or may not do what I said I was going to do. Yeah, it is. It is. It is definitely frustrating. But it doesn't mean that there aren't ways to improve. Um, how we how we work with people who are homeless, and it's not just about finding them a home. I know that that's like a nice, neat yeah. um, solution to to many people, but there's so much more than that to yeah. be done. Yeah, yeah. If somebody becomes homeless, it's for a multitude of complex reasons, and a key to a flat doesn't fix most of them it fixes one of them Mm, yeah definitely this has been so interesting especially for an area that feels urgent and yet Mm. has had so little kind of official work done on it yeah definitely definitely i i do i i actually had um someone contacted me recently asking me do you know of any you know what what sort of have you got any access to any research and I had to say embarrassingly no there's these three articles or four articles five whatever um and I guess that's how I felt when I started my work in the hoarding area that there was like oh there's one or two (laughs) systematic reviews there's one or two this and that and we are building up a body of evidence. Um, but it's not all about that as well. We need to be doing things. We need to be doing things without the tick of, you know, research supporting us. We need to look at what those frontline um, practitioners are saying and talking to the people who need the support. What is it that you need? What, what, what happened to you to bring you to this place? And then how can I support you in your life moving forward? What are your priorities for your life moving forward? Let's work on those. Yeah, exactly. Asking what their priorities are because often we just, we have these stereotypical thought processes of, you know, how people should live, but that's not for us to say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jan, if people want to find you online, where can they do so? Uh, they could pop over to X. I love saying that now. I love it. <laughs> to X. They can X me on X at stuff underscore ology or Instagram, same, at stuff underscore ology. Or on Facebook, they can go to Stuffology Consulting. Um, if you're a Pinteresty person, I'm at stuff underscore ology there. I have a lot of boards. I am not a board hoarder, I promise. <laughs> uh, if it's, uh, it's a fairly, it's a fairly damage free thing to hoard. I think. I know, I know. That's what I feel. That's how I feel. I like, I feel like I could accumulate stuff there and feel, you know, safe. <laughs> safe in my hoarding in that space but I do I'm I'm a particularly prolific Pinteraster (laughs) Uh, or you could just send me drop me a line just just send me an email jan at stuffology.com.au pop onto the website um, stuffology.com.au and sign up for the newsletter um, that comes out on a Sunday usually some interesting stuff in there for most people and yeah just keep on listening, learning, being curious and letting go of stuff that no longer serves you, I guess. Thank you, Jan. Really, really good conversation. Thanks for having me. May we take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we record and listen to this podcast today. 
I'm speaking on the lands of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge their connection to country, both land and sea, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today. Do you want to be a de-hoarding darling? You can be now at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding uk slash darling if you love the podcast and want a bit extra you can finally sign up to subscribe members will get an exclusive monthly post with an additional top tip some podcast and music recommendations and a personal update from me about how things are going find out the full details at overcome compulsive uk slash darling So shout out this week to the Afford Anything podcast. Little clip about asking yourself questions. And while, well, I'll let her tell you first. Develop a catchphrase that you will repeat to yourself whenever you're about to spend money. For example, that catchphrase might be, would I rather spend X or would I rather put this money towards and then insert goal here, right? So for example, when I was saving up money to travel, whenever I was on the verge of making a purchase, I would say, hey, you know what? Would I rather buy this thing or would I rather have an extra $20 that I could put towards my travel fund? And that was sort of a a catchphrase or a, a question that I repeated to myself every time I was about to make a purchase. So think about a goal that you have and then turn that into a catchphrase or a question that you constantly ask yourself, hey, would I rather buy these Apple AirPods or would I rather have an extra $150 to put towards my trip to Thailand? So while she was talking specifically about spending money, that might apply in your case. It might be about acquiring stuff that's free, or it might be about something like, do I really want to keep this item or do I want the space more? Or is it more important to me to have this than it is to have a tidy home? So have a think about some useful questions that might help you on your path. Okay, thank you for listening and I will speak to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. You can find more online at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash support and do subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. There may be links in this podcast that earn me money. This doesn't come at any extra cost to you if you ever make a purchase through the links and it helps to support the future of the podcast. Shelter who told the Atlantic a lot of times in their minds it's preparing for the personal acopolite. Uh, <laughs> what's an acopolite? <laughs> the personal acopolite. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was not expecting that to come out wrong. Acopolypse. 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 Okay, go. I've got to say it twice as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I have to say it later. <laughs> okay. Okay. A, l- <clears throat> A lot of times in their minds, it's preparing for the personal... (laughs) (laughs) The personal apocalypse. Personal apocalypse. Personal apocalypse. Personal Personal apocalypse. Personal apocalypse. A lot of times in their minds, it's preparing for the personal apocalypse. It's when my... 
Hey everyone, Craig Robinson here. I want you to check out the Ways to Win podcast brought to you by Ford and the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. On Ways to Win, Coach Cal and I will discuss leadership lessons we've learned. We know all about the days spent perfecting your craft outside of the limelight and have knowledge to share about how strength, inspiration, encouragement, and adaptability are the key ingredients to drive toward your dreams. And those same ingredients can be found in the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. So check out my podcast, Ways to Win, and also check out the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. Learn more at Ford.com. Built Ford tough, built Ford proud. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey, y'all. I'm Erin Haynes, editor-at-large for the 19th News and a journalist who has spent the last 20 years working hard to tell the truth. I'm also a Black woman born and raised in the South, so I've seen how often journalists get stories wrong. That's why I decided to start The Amendment, a weekly podcast where I talk to folks with unique perspectives to try to get at the truth behind the biggest stories of our day. Whether that means talking to Wesley Morris about the politics behind the Oscars. I do spend a lot of time thinking about like, wonder how this would have gone if Anatomy of a Fall was about a black woman. Jail. (laughs) Or Nicole Hannah-Jones about the stakes of our election. We have to figure out how to not just cover Trump, but all of the ways that democracy is being eroded. Tune into The Amendment. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com.